Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, another morning to celebrate with one another all that you have done in creating the world and sustaining it, in entering this world and solving our greatest problem uh, by taking upon yourself in the person of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the sins of everyone who would ever believe that we might be rescued from the consequences eternally of our sin. Rescued from judgment and condemnation, having been forgiven completely. We thank you that you also rescue us from the power of sin. That those of us who are in Christ are no longer slaves of sin. And we also thank you that one day you will rescue us finally and completely, even from the very presence of sin. From our dwelling in the midst of a sinful and broken and rebellious world but also removing from us completely the residue of indwelling sin inside of us. We recognize, O Lord, that we are our greatest enemies. Uh, There is, of course, the devil. uh, There is the world around us. But our greatest enemy uh, is inside our hearts. Uh, This becomes a daily battle for us, a fight. and, And at times this battle is wearying. Oh, we want to be like your son, in greater measure every day by the power of your spirit. And yet we, we feel the struggle. We feel the strain. And this certainly makes us homesick to be with you forever and be rid of sin altogether. But in the meantime, O Lord, we, we thank you that the fight within reveals the presence of your spirit doing battle with the residue of our depravity. And we thank you that the discipline that comes from you is a mark of your fatherly affections. And so we don't resent you for the struggle, but we do ask your help in it. And this morning, as we look more at our fight with sin, we pray that you would give us biblical balance, that you would give us your perspective. And you know, each one of us, you know, our hearts thoroughly, completely far better than we do. We are not good judges of these things, but you are. And so we ask for your help and we are confident that you will give it by your word in Jesus name. Amen. We've spent a a couple of weeks recently in equipping hour dealing with the doctrine of repentance, the practice of repentance, and, and perhaps in thinking through some categories of repentance, you have thought more deeply and more thoroughly about indwelling sin than you ever had before. When we looked at the marks of genuine repentance, perhaps you, as I have been, were convicted about how shallow our repentances so often are. Uh, We're not often digging up all the roots of sin categories and seeing the idolatries behind them and the unbelief underneath all of it. And then thinking back on how have I seen my sin and turned from my sin. uh, Perhaps you, like I, have recognized that my repentances need to be repented of. That I have taken far too shallow a swing at my sin. And so those have been heavy topics for us. The topic for this morning's equipping hour is simply labeled introspection. And I'm going to commend to you this morning a a bit of a corrective for those of us who are morbidly introspective. And we'll describe what I mean by that this morning. But there is perhaps an overreaction to the seriousness of sin that winds us up in a place of unbelief and further sin because we think, too myopically, too selfishly, too self-trustingly about our sin. And so I want to give us some help this morning in thinking about a a topic that, that many have called introspection or morbid introspection. Some have labeled this scrupulosity. In case you needed a new word that is impossible to spell, It comes from the idea of scruples, and and scruples really comes from a Latin word of some sharp, pointy object jabbing at you. And the idea is that your conscience is pricked and causing you pain over something internal. And if somebody has scruples about something, it means they're, they're unwilling to do something, unwilling to go down some path, unwilling to cut some corner or cheat or lie or do something they perceive as wrong. 
because it brings pangs of conscience and they just can't get over their scruples to cheat at Yahtzee or whatever the, whatever the thing is. Some have called scrupulosity or morbid introspection Christian OCD. You may have heard of obsessive compulsive disorder. It is in the psychiatric diagnostic and statistical manuals describing something of a a mental health issue, a, a disordered thinking, a disease, if you will, that involves obsessing over thoughts and being compelled to activities. And the idea is these obsessive thoughts have taken me captive. How do I get relief from these obsessive thoughts that just have me pinned down? I've got to do something. And so the compulsive behavior flows out of the obsessive thinking. And the world has recognized this uneasy feeling prompted by conscience or principles that leads to frenetic activity. And they've given a label to it. There are, of course, good observations that the psychiatric and psychological world can make. We might drop the D in OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, because that might lend us to wrong thinking about disease and maybe some of the remedies for disease when we put it in sort of medical or physiological terminology. But it is disordered thinking. If if what we're thinking about OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is at the thought level, at the level of the inner man, how, how we think about our sin or how we think about our scruples or conscience issues or intrusive thoughts, then we need to set them in biblical order. We need to think God's thoughts after him. There is a corrective in thinking that needs to take place. So we might consider this disordered thinking indeed. But if the word disorder leads us to think unhelpfully in terms of disease, we we may drop that. Obsession is a thought that has taken you captive. You remember Paul's instructions that say, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is the losing side of that wrestling match. I'm not taking my thoughts captive. My thoughts are taking me captive. That's what we mean by an obsession, an obsessive thought. Sometimes this is an intrusive thought, a a thought you didn't see coming, a thought you didn't premeditate, a, a thought that sort of injects itself into your conscious thinking. It could be a fear. It could be a temptation, and it's, it's important for us to understand that our desires for sinful things are themselves sinful, but not all temptations are at the level of heart-born sinful desires. There are temptations that come to us externally. There are temptations that come by way of intrusive thoughts. And so to sort of separate out temptations from sinful desires or sinful activities is important. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who never sinned, who could not sin, was himself tempted. Not by anything internally, but by external things. So it's important for us to recognize that an obsessive thought can happen from any number of things. But it is obsessive. It is out of order. And a compulsion is an activity that is pursued to give relief from the captivating thought. And if you think about OCD, man, that that, that guy is OCD. What are we thinking of? You might be thinking of germophobia and excessive hand washing. What is the what is the fear? Well, germs exist. It's it's based in reality and germs cause all kinds of physiological problems. That's based in reality. But a, but a germaphobe is one who has an inordinate fear of germs that produces an activity intended to give relief from the obsessive thought. And so continual hand washing and an obsessive compulsive fear and activity 
would produce the kind of hand washing that says, okay, did I wash my hands enough? Was that 30 seconds? You know, I'm going to go 45 seconds. And when I'm done, I'm not sure that was antibacterial soap. I'm going to go back and do it again. You know, the temperature on that faucet wasn't quite high enough. I'm going to do it a third time. And when I leave the faucet, I think, did I actually wash my hands or did I just think I washed my hands? I'm going to go back and do it again. It is this obsession with germs must be rid of and I will pervasively compulsively continue activities to eradicate my fears about those thoughts. Now listen, we are, as believers, particularly sensitive creatures. By God's design, we are to have our antenna up on sins within. We've been talking about that with our doctrine of repentance. How do we live out a, a real act of turning from sin and turning unto righteousness in the internal man? And we're dealing with activities and thoughts and motives and desires that need to be turned away from, which means you need to see them, which means you need to look inward and examine yourself. And the Christian life is to be one of repentances. Not just a front door into salvation, but a continual life of ongoing, seeing sin in my life and turning from it. Reprogramming my thoughts and reordering my behaviors. That's just the Christian life and it's a constant battle. And so if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 for a moment. 1 Thessalonians 5 is, is one of those endings of one of Paul's letters. You get doctrine at the front end and then sort of this running list of do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Sort of practical application to the doctrine. And 1 Thessalonians 5 is the sort of applicational section of this letter. And, and listen to some of the commands here. Verse 14, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Don't repay evil for evil. Always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies. Verse 21, examine all things Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. That is a, a long list of commands that seem to include everything. Because they do. Be patient with everyone. Give thanks in all things. Take no vengeance for anything. These are lofty commands requiring diligent obedience that are the natural, logical outflow of the doctrine that comes in the first portions of the letter. Just as Paul says in Romans 12, it is your logical or reasonable service to offer your whole life as a sacrifice to God in view of his mercy. Same thing here. But notice verse 21, examine or scrutinize everything. And, and the Christian with the tender conscience is thinking scrutinize everything. Well, the first thing that needs scrutiny is my own heart. So I'm just going to go through this list. Have I rejoiced always? Like, always. I stubbed my toe the other day and I whimpered. That's not rejoicing. Have I, have I sinned against the Lord? I need to go back and think through the, the quality of my rejoicing as I stubbed my toe. Did I do it right? Did, did anybody hear me groan in pain? Have I offended? And, and you just get in this cycle of scrutiny, sort of overthinking every aspect of the battle with sin in the Christian life. There's a, there's a temptation to get there for some. Think about 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. And so this can even go to an extreme level where you say, I, I, I whimpered when I stubbed my toe and that's not rejoicing always. And that's not considering trials to be joy all the time. And man, can I even be a Christian? How could a Christian live like this? And some of you are going, well, that's just crazy. I've never thought like that. <laughs> and some of you are thinking, that's me. Here's the reality. We, 
We need to learn our own tendencies a little bit. Are you the type that is likely to be more oblivious to sin? Stub my, so, stub my toe, utter a curse word, complain and grumble the rest of the day. I didn't even think that was sin. <laughs> I didn't care about it. I, I, I can uh, grumble and complain and curse when I don't stub my toe. In fact, I have every excuse right now to complain against the Lord. It's justified. I mean, well, of course there's sin in there. And, and you might be the type that's like oblivious to sin, never asking the questions, never examining your own heart. And you've got work to do there, my friend. But you might be the type that is easily crushed at the thought that you might have sinned. Or the thought that you might sin potentially in the future. Because you know how bad sin is, and you know you've got it in you, and you just might do something that you're going to regret, or that might cost you eternity. That is the morbid, morbidly introspective. And so, you need to know yourself a little bit, and know what your tendencies are. Two weeks ago in Equipping Hour, we, we talked about self-trust. And this is a great category to think, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust the Lord. And, and we're going to need to go to Scripture to help us trust Him as we dig into our own hearts and seek to fight sin. And there are times where we need to have some trusted people around us where we can bounce our self-examination off of others. People that love us, people that, that we know will shoot straight with us. We're not looking for people to flatter us and unburden our consciences unhelpfully. But we may need some people in our lives that will help us to see, I think you're overthinking this. And we'll get to some remedies before we're done today. I would venture to say this. Most of us don't go deep enough with sin. Most of us don't go far enough in unearthing our sin. And the reality for all of us, even for the morbidly introspective, you need to know your sin is way worse than you think it is. It's way darker, way blacker, more infective than you think it could possibly be. It's more extensive than any of us can measure. It's blacker than any of us can perceive. And there is more sin in us than we even know to turn from. You can be digging down into repentances. And listen, you'll never repent perfectly in this life. And you won't need to repent in the next. So don't think you're ever going to get this locked down. But we turn from sin and we turn to God in faith, trusting Him with the remedies God gives. And the reality is, we're never touching all that is wrong in our lives, all that's displeasing. I'm convinced that if God showed us everything in our hearts that was errant and unchristlike all at one moment, (laughs) I don't know what would happen to us physiologically. Is it spontaneous combustion? Do you just go unconscious and keel over and die? Uh, You know, you you would want to take matters into your own hands. It would be so dark, so awful to see all that God could see about our sin in one moment. We couldn't take it. The task of the Christian life is not to find all of those things in a given moment. But to confess what we know, turn from what we see, and trust the Lord with the rest. We'll we'll get to that remedy. Some of us, well, well, I think none of us go as deep as we could or even should in our repentances. Some of us, and, and maybe all of us sometimes get tangled up in this morbid introspection that trusts self to assess the condition of my heart and then prescribe behaviors to remedy it. And that's problematic, both in the obsessing and in the compulsions. I think about Martin Luther and you think about the, the, the pre-Christian Martin Luther So this is Martin Luther as the monk, as the priest, as the academic, as the scholar, as the teacher. He he was a, a medieval Catholic and his conscience was burdened and he had no remedy. He would go to the confessional booth and he would offload his conscience with the things that he knew to do, knew he needed to confess to the priest who's sitting on the other side of the confessional booth through this 
mechanism that's designed to offload the conscience, but actually gives no remedy before God. It, it, it's just a, a ritualistic thing. And he's doing this week after week, in fact, day after day. And Martin Luther would spend hours in the confessional booth saying what he knew he had done wrong. And he knew that the righteousness of God was this impenetrable, unreachable standard that loomed over him like an ogre. He said, I hated the righteousness of God. The very concept of it when I read my Bible was an enemy to me. And he would go into the confessional booth and just list all the ways he knew he didn't meet the standard. And after he was done, two, three hours into the deal, he would walk out, get a couple steps away, and, and just feel like, in my confession, I sinned some more, and would walk back into the booth. And the priest, hearing the confession, would say, Martin, get out of here. <laughs> Enough already. And he didn't have gospel remedies for his burdened conscience. All he had was the mechanism of medieval Catholicism. It couldn't unburden his conscience. It couldn't actually bring forgiveness. It, it could for some have the cathartic effect of, hey, I got that off my chest. I feel better now. For others, it was the route to hypocrisy. I can uh, sin like the devil all week, but before Sunday morning, I'm going to go to the confessional and then I can go to church and repeat the cycle over and over again. But for Martin Luther with a burdened conscience, he needed gospel remedies that his theology did not have. In fact, when he came to grace, when he came to the gospel, and he saw again the righteousness in Romans 3, he did not any longer see it as the enemy, the impenetrable standard that could not be reached. He saw it as the gift that God gives on the basis of faith to all who believe, which is what we need. We need his righteousness and we can't make the standard, but God gives it as a free gift by his grace in the gospel to everybody who believes in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So Martin Luther's embracing of the good news was the solution to his medieval OCD. And we need some of those same solutions as we think about this in the Christian life. The... The morbid introspection can bring about a paralysis of uncertainty. Did I sin? Um, did, did I not sin? Might I sin? And if I do sin in this way, what would it say about me? And will I lose my salvation? These kinds of thoughts can, can go through the mind. Michael Emlett is a biblical counselor. He wrote an article called Scrupulosity When Doubts Devour. And he de described it this way, intrusive, that is spontaneous, unbidden, unwanted thoughts and obsessive behaviors, persistent, recurring with their doubts about moral, spiritual issues produce distressing levels of anxiety and the quest to rid oneself of that anxiety, usually by one or more of the following, performing compulsive behaviors, engaging in mental rituals, or by avoiding triggering situations. Now, this is a, a serious hamster wheel for those caught up in this sort of thought pattern. A heightened conscience that fears having sinned in some way or fears that one might sin in some way can be paralyzing. It can keep you from actually obeying God in ways you need to obey God out of fear that you'll disobey Him in the thing you're obsessing about. I sat in a lecture a couple years ago given by a biblical counselor named Brent Osterberg. And he's written a, a tiny little pamphlet called... Um, What's the word again? Scrupulosity. <laughs> and, and it's really helpful. Uh, you can read it in a half hour. I would commend that to you as a resource. He described in that lecture going to Disneyland with his family. And, and while his wife was paying at a checkout in a, in a gift shop, he noticed across the room some stranger spilled their drink on the floor. And the thoughts went through his mind. Oh, somebody should clean that up. Well, if I'm a Christian and I love others, I should clean that up. 
And then it was time for the family to leave. The lights were going out and the, the place was clearing out and, and, and he had little kids in strollers. He needed to be, uh, you know, hands, all hands on deck helping his wife. And, and so uh, they all left and he was so troubled and so burdened by his potential lack of love at not cleaning up someone else's mess that he left his wife and, and left the little children with her to run back into the store and mop up the mess out of fear that he was sinning if he didn't. And he realized, and this is a, a seasoned biblical counselor working on a, a second um, uh, postgraduate degree who is troubled in his conscience with this thinking. And, and he began to realize that this sort of Christian OCD was a pattern in his life. He began learning how to deal with these thought patterns and in that particular case, he, he became burdened by the fact that he abandoned his family to go do something he was burdened by. And then it just cycled, producing anxiety, depression, fear, leading to the questions, am I even a Christian? This is a serious cycle. Others have described similar thoughts and behaviors. Some counselees have described the fear that uh, one, one lady in particular, that she might shout obscenities at the pastor while he's preaching. Yeah, I know you've been thinking about that. Now you're thinking about it even more. And this is a lady who did not have a salty tongue. She had never done it before. She didn't even want to do it. She, she was mortified at the thought. But this thought came into her mind that she would do it. And what if she did? What would people then know about her heart and all the pollution that was in her heart that would just come out and it would be in church and everybody would see it. And is she even a Christian? How could a Christian do such things? And she had progressed from thinking this intrusive thought. Oh, what if I did that? Oh, I could do that. I might do that. I probably will do that. And so she stopped going to church. And the obsessive thought produced a compulsive behavior. What was she compelled to do? I do not want to sin it that way. So I'm going to remove all stumbling blocks. <laughs> all of us are the stumbling blocks. And then she is neglecting obedience in another area. Do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. Now she's actually sinning out of fear of potentially sinning. Doesn't even want to do it. What if I actually did it? What kind of a person would I be? Some have obsessed over the idea of the unpardonable sin. I did. I had to do some research to figure out what that was. Okay. No, you can't do that today. But the unpardonable sin, in case me bringing it up makes you wonder... Uh, is, is discussed in Matthew 12 and 13. It's that remarkable transition where Jesus is performing miracles out in public. He's teaching in public and the religious leadership says, you're casting out demons by Satan. And Jesus says, uh, if, if I'm casting out demons by Satan, who are you casting them out by? Um, but since you've said that, that the son of man is, is doing satanic miracles, Listen, you can say anything you want about the Son of Man. This is a paraphrase. But don't talk about the Holy Spirit that way. Anyone who does that will not be forgiven ever. And you might be thinking, oh, even as Smed just said that, I had the intrusive thought about blaspheming the Holy Spirit and I just did it just now while he was talking. I can't be saved. I've committed the unpardonable sin. No, that's not the unpardonable sin. You had to have been present on the earth when the Son of Man was actually casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit and be in religious leadership claiming it was satanic to have committed that sin. So you haven't done it this morning while I've been talking. And you didn't do it when you were seven, but you don't remember it. So you can cast that fear out of your mind. But that is something in the sort of evangelical world people get hung up on. Maybe I've done it. Maybe I can't be saved. And they will discredit the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives that has caused them to believe the gospel, to love Christ, and to actually be progressively conformed into his image. 
And here's the real problem with the obsessing that is myopic, that looks inward and stays there and actually neglects the grace of God active in the life. It's actually, it's actually sin to just look at your sin all the time and not look to the gospel and the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of a believer. Bruno Osterberg goes on to identify some of the flaws in this thinking. And, and the first he identifies is a misdirected trust. A misdirected trust. It is self-trust when I obsess over the potentiality of my sin in such a way that it produces unbiblical remedies, compulsions. It is a misdirected trust to assess. It is, I value my opinion over the condition of my heart more than anybody else's. And I want you to turn to Psalm 139. To get out of this cycle, if you're in it, you need to do a couple of things. One is to remember that God knows. And this is a great prayer. Psalm 139, 1 to 3. Oh, Yahweh, you have searched me and known me. Completed actions. God already, God's already there. You know when I sit down and I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. And then in verse 4, before I even utter a word, you know it. That is a helpful reminder that it is not your task to be exhaustive on all the potentialities of the dark recesses of your own heart and then to trust your assessment of those. Listen, we, we spend a lot of time talking about being thorough in our repentances. But you can't go beyond what you see. You, you can't go beyond what the Holy Spirit in His providence by His Word and through your circumstances and through discipline and, and through your own timely self-examination reveals. You, 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 you work with what you know. And God knows you far better than you know you. And so we have to trust Him. We have to entrust ourselves to Him. The other remedy for misdirected trust is to have somebody who loves sanctification, who loves the, the holiness of God and the holiness in Christian living, be a sounding board for your self-analysis. Just have some good friends that love the holiness of Christ, are praying for your growth in Christ to be a sounding board for obsessive thoughts. Osterberg identifies a second flaw in the thinking. It is not just misdirected trust, but also misdirected love. Misdirected love. When the obsessions turn to compulsions. So I'm obsessing over whether I, I might say a, a bad word in church. My compulsion drives me to Avoiding church altogether, avoiding people, not speaking out of fear, producing a whole host of other sins. And, and what I've done there is I've raised my abilities to remedy my anxieties higher than they belong. My, my self-assessment, I, I shouldn't be trusting myself, let's start there. But then my remedies, I've prescribed for myself like a physician. Here, take two of these and call me in the morning. Uh, don't come to church anymore, don't talk to people. Then you won't sin against them. Well, that's bad medicine. And it is a self-love that says, my standard of righteousness... My extra rules, my barriers, my uh, making no provision for the flesh to the extreme is the right path. In that case, you've, you've actually loved your own standard of righteousness more than God's prescriptions for your life, which require a certain level of vulnerability. I'm going to self-protect through what we might call autosoterism. 
Uh, soteriology, the study of salvation, auto, self. It's self-salvation. It's self-righteousness. It's, I'm assessing my problem. I'm giving the solution. It, it hasn't gone vertical. It's just stayed right here with me. This is the fundamental problem of all human religion. Misdiagnose the problem, provide human solutions. We can do this in sanctification. You, you can miss the gospel through human religion, and you can forget the gospel in sanctification. And the idea is that you would look to yourself to trust your own assessment of your heart, and then look to yourself to provide your own remedies. And we get into all kinds of trouble that way. He identifies a third flaw, not just misdirected trust, self-trust, and misdirected love, self-love, but he also identifies selectivity. That is, those caught up in obsessive, compulsive sanctification process have selected certain things to obsess over and neglected others. The, the, the person who is OCD in the world's eyes and, and a germaphobe, afraid of, of germs so badly that you spend 75% of your life washing your hands, hasn't, chose to, hasn't chosen to face all potential fears with that kind of compulsion. It's highly selective. You, you, you've narrowed down your focus to the things you want to focus on. And, and, and so the lady who's afraid of shouting obscenities in church has narrowed down sanctification to a, a very small band of activity. And the reality is the world's a whole lot bigger than that. And so the danger of selectivity is we, we focus our attention on, on one thing or, or a handful of things, obsess over those things, and then come up with our own remedies or activities to, to prevent us from ever getting near the temptation or opportunity to live those out. I want to give us this morning some straightforward steps to get us out of a depressing, immobilizing introspective paralysis. If you're on this hamster wheel and you're thinking about these things, uh, if you've been there or you want to help somebody else who is there, uh, let me give you some passages to work with. And, and as I give these passages, I, in, in a several of the articles I read, uh, counselors who had worked in this area quite a bit cautioned that if somebody's fear is obsessing over what the Bible says about how I need to think. I'm taking them to the source of their fear. It's, a, it's an interesting conundrum. God's going to give a standard of how to think. Yeah, what if I don't meet that standard? What if I can't meet that standard? What if I'm not elect? What if the Holy Spirit's not in me and not able to resonate with the Word of God when you show it to me? So I'm not going to read my Bible. <laughs> and, and the compulsive activity flows out of the obsessive thoughts. But I would still suggest to you that the Bible is the answer. How do we get off of that hamster wheel? We need to hear from God. I'm going to take you to Ecclesiastes to start with. This is perhaps a, an easily misunderstood verse. And, and perhaps in a strange place to find it. Ecclesiastes 7.16, I'm just going to read it and let it sit with you for a moment. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you make yourself desolate? <laughs> what in the world is Solomon commending here? I mean, doesn't the Bible say, be holy as I am holy? Uh, be perfect Colossians 1.28, every man complete in Christ. Examine your hearts. Pursue wisdom. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Do everything you can to get wisdom. Sacrifice everything else to get wisdom. And here's a verse that says, ah, righteousness, wisdom, not that important. <laughs> Is that what he's saying? It's important to recognize the way he says this. And this is God's wisdom. He says, do not be overly righteous. And, and we might put righteous in quotes there. We're not talking about God's standard of righteousness. Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't get to heaven. 
Unless you have the gift of Jesus' perfect righteousness in the gospel, you're not getting to heaven. And then the gift of righteousness produces a life that pursues righteousness. But, but his, by his standards, what is this overly righteous stuff Solomon's talking about? Again, the theme in Ecclesiastes is an under the sun perspective to drive us to look over the sun and get our joy and completion and satisfaction in him. There is a, a way to think about rightness, righteousness, which is from me, through me, and to me. And you think about this in the world's perspectives with diet and exercise. You can kill yourself being overly righteous in diet and exercise. Anything good, in fact, you can overdo. Did you know that you can overhydrate? In Arizona, you're not living in that fear. But I read the encyclopedic work on all the deaths in the Grand Canyon in recorded human history. Every single one up through the time of publication. Fascinating book. I don't suggest you read it if you want to go to the Grand Canyon because you might not want to go. Lots of dehydration deaths. But, but I think there were two overhydration deaths. People so afraid of dehydrating, they overhydrated and died. Anything good taken to this overly righteous thing can actually be harmful. And that's what Solomon is going after here. And he says, uh, do not be overly wise. In other words, work yourself into a tizzy trying to think about the wisest thing you could possibly do. Elsewhere in the book of Proverbs, Solomon would actually call this uh, overly wise perspective on life, laziness. In fact, he says it's the lazy fool who looks at the road and says, there could be a lion, and then he doesn't go to work. He starves and doesn't provide for his family. In other words, he's thinking about all the potentialities. He's thinking about, he's being really, really wise about all the things that could happen, and so he's paralyzed. This is a, a helpful verse for us in thinking about obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are idolatries. I'm fixating on something in an inordinate manner. I'm thinking about it more than God wants me to think about it. I'm not listening to the whole counsel of scripture and I'm narrowed in on what I think I need to be considering. Obsession can be an idol and a compulsion is again this self-salvific perspective on solutions. I'm going to do what I need to do to relieve my anxieties over this obsessive thought. And oftentimes in the obsessive compulsive cycle, really what we're doing is not even asking, how do I please the Lord? But how do I get relief from my burdened, obsessed conscience? And that's, a, that's a, again, a very self-focused and dangerous spot. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. If we put the obsessive thought into the category of anxieties, and I think we should, we have a very straightforward command here. I trust you know this already. First Peter 5, 7, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You find yourself in, in, in a cycle of obsessive thinking. What should you do? Cast your cares. The idea of taking those off of me and flinging them before the throne of grace. Throw them there and leave them. And you have grounds to take those off and throw them before the throne of grace and leave them there. And the ground is in that same verse because he cares for you. You think about your resources to care for details, for anxieties, for obsessive thoughts in your life. Think about your resources, the tools you have at your disposal, and think about God's tools and resources. Why should we cast our cares on him? Because he cares for us. He has what it takes to meet our needs, and he loves us. One of the, one of the great Ways to consider, am, am I casting my cares? 
a great way to sort of test drive that for us is, uh, did I walk away and I still have them? <laughs> don't short prayer. Don't, don't, don't undercut the power of prayer in this. And listen, the, the, the obsessive compulsive Christian can make a ritual out of prayer. <laughs> you can become obsessive and just the, I need to say the thing again and say the thing again. I'm not sure I've cast my cares. If I cast my cares, how can I even be a Christian? If I haven't cast my cares and you can do the whole thing over again. But the whole point is pray, ask God, God, here are my cares. Please take this burden and walk away from them in faith. Turn to Psalm 119. The longest song in the book of songs. And the theme of Psalm 119 is all about the the beauty and the power of God's word. And I believe this psalm speaks to this very issue. Look down at verse 59. I thought upon my ways and I turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. Notice where verse 59 starts at self-examination. I thought about my ways. I I looked inward at the intricacies of the paths, the the roads, the, 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 the courses of the Pulsing of neurons in my brain. I I thought about how I think about what I think. (laughs) But notice the second half of verse 59. And I turned my feet to your testimonies. That's a good turn. We are supposed to examine ourselves. We we do that every week as we take the Lord's table. We, We are supposed to test ourselves to see if we're in the faith. We are supposed to look inward. But then there's a turn and I turned my feet to your testimonies. I, I opened my Bible and, and, and read God's word all over again. I, I can't just sit there in my own thoughts. Again, I can't trust my own assessments. There is a, a scrutiny that will take place, but, but to be informed with the word of God and all of its beauty and balance is so critical. And then look at verse 60. I hastened. I, I hurried up. And I did not delay. Two ways to say the same thing. To what? To keep your commandments. What does that mean to keep God's commandments? Lock them in a box and store them on the shelf? No, it means to do. To do them. To to obey. I'm looking for a path of obedience. If you sit in the muck of self-examination and just stay there. You're not actually doing what God prescribes. It's not actually the remedy. Examine your own heart and then open your Bible and get God's heart and then go do something. Find something to obey. Find a a commandment to keep. I'm afraid I might have an outburst of obscenities in church. If we can obsess over that or... We can think about that. Oh, Lord, I don't want to do that. Where did that thought come from? I've never wanted to do that before. Or maybe I really do want to do that, depending on what's being said and who's saying it. (laughs) Go to God's word. Confess those things. Unburden your heart in prayer. Get God's counsel on your life. and, And then turn your heart, your feet, your hands towards something to obey. Don't linger on self. Lingering on self is dangerous business. Turn to 1 John 1. Notice the end of verse 7. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's gospel truth. Got to believe that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
These are present tense verbs. The, the force of that means this is an ongoing reality in the Christian life. This is not a how to become a Christian verse. This is how to go on living like a Christian verse. Christians sin. We're not slaves of sin, but we sin out of our residual nature. And when we sin, we confess. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The details of verse 9 are are really important. What can you confess? Potential sins? Sins that you fear you might commit one day? Sins you don't know about? No, you can't confess any of those things. You confess sins that you do. And that's not just outward behaviors. We've talked about that. It's it's the motives of the heart. Confess your foul motives. It's It's the thoughts that lead to it. It's errant desires that need to be addressed. Confess those things. But notice what God does. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. That is the ones we confess. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There goes the fear of potentialities. There goes the fear of having done something I'm unaware of. There goes the the need to sit on the hamster wheel and cycle over this. What if I did something I didn't know that I did? And and it could have been sin. I need to sit here longer and keep looking for it. God is faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, of course, there's more sin than you know. But you can only fight what you know. So you confess what you know and you trust God's cleansing Listen, we, we put sin off, we put righteousness in its place, we, we move in the direction of obedience, getting the heart and the feet and the hands moving towards that which pleases the Lord. It helps get our eyes off of self. Going to the gospel gets our eyes on Christ. Serving others gets our eyes out horizontally away from ourselves. What should we do if, if you're the morbid introspector? Well, there's thinking to correct. There's theology to learn. But then there's a go and serve and do. I want to I want to leave you with a with a final thought, and this is a lengthy quote. I I wrestled uh, with my computer a little bit um, trying to get this quote on the screen. I won't have it on the screen for you. Uh, I will put this up in a. Um, a note on the web attached to this message so that you can have it in print. But this comes from Octavius Winslow in a morning devotional um, dated August 24th. And um, Octavius Winslow is a old dead guy. Maybe this will resonate. The theme of this long quote is simply this fighting sin is worship. As we talked about two weeks on repentance and a week on self-trust and, and, and maybe you thought more deeply about your sin, more thoroughly about your sin than you ever have before. And you're thinking, oh, this is just a, a monstrous task. When do I get to get on with the, the, the real great stuff of the Christian life? <clears throat> I want to encourage you. That your fight with sin is itself the, the real great stuff of the Christian life. In other words, it, it brings God glory. It honors Him. It, it is worship. And if you find yourself in sort of the Christian OCD realm, that learning to rethink that and get off that hamster wheel and cast your cares on Him and not think about yourself so much, that a, that a fight with that kind of thinking is a fight worth having because it is worship. So I'll let Octavius Winslow unpack this for us. He says, the fight with sin is that internal righteousness, the work of God, the Holy Spirit, that consists in the subjugation of the mind, the will, the affections, the desires, yes, the whole soul to the government and supremacy of Jesus. Bringing into captivity, says the Apostle Paul, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, you who are striving against sin, 
You who are longing to be conformed to the image of God's Son, you're panting to be more pure in heart, you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, think that in every step you take in the path of holiness, with every corruption subdued, every besetting sin laid aside, every holy desire begotten, Christ is glorified in you. You may reply, the more I strive for the mastery over sin, the more I seem to be conquered. And the stronger I oppose my sins, the stronger my sins seem to be. And he says, but what does that prove? It proves that God is in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. That the kingdom of God is invading the kingdom of Satan. That the spirit dwelling in the heart is actually at war with the flesh. As John Owen said, if a believer leaves his sins alone, his sins will leave him alone. But if he searches them out, brings them to the light, opposes them, fights them, mortifies them, then they will struggle more for the victory. And so this inward warfare undeniably marks the inhabitation of God and the Holy Spirit in the soul. In other words, you you know you're a Christian because the fight is on inside. Winslow goes on, to see one advancing in holiness, thirsting after God, the heart fixed in its solemn purpose of entire surrender, cultivating higher views, aiming for a loftier standard, to behold him carving his way to God's throne through mighty opposition, fightings without, fears within, striving to master some besetting sin, sometimes foiling and sometimes being foiled. Sometimes with the shout of victory on the lip and sometimes with the painful consciousness of defeat bowing down the heart. Yet still onward and the needle of his soul, he's talking about a compass needle. Slow and tremulous but with certain and true movement still pointing to its glorious attraction, God. That's a faith that can't fail and a hope that can't die, a love that can never be quenched. We hang amid our warfare with all the weakness fastened on Christ. And how is Christ glorified in that fight? Oh, to be like Jesus, he says. He is meek and, low, low, meek and lowly, gentle, kind, forgiving. He's without duplicity, without deceit, without malice, without revenge, without distemper, without a thought or feeling or look that is unholy. Oh, to be like him. Beloved, mistake not the nature and the evidence of growth and sanctification. In all your self-denial in this great work, be cautious of grace denial. You will need much holy wisdom here, lest you overlook the work of the Spirit within you. Maybe you've thought that the glory that Christ receives from brilliant genius and profound talent, from splendid gifts and glowing zeal, from costly sacrifices and even extensive usefulness is great. And you and I may think of the the heroes of the faith and the missionaries and the people who really glorified Jesus with their lives. Winslow says, but have you ever thought of the glory the far greater, richer glory that flows to him from a contrite spirit, a broken heart, a lowly mind, a humble walk, from the tear of godly repentance that falls when seen by no human eye, and the sigh of godly sorrow that is breathed when heard by no human ear, from the sin abhorrence and self-loathing, the deep sense of vileness, poverty, and infirmity that takes you to Jesus with the prayer, Lord, here I am. I've brought to you my rebellious will, my wandering heart, my worldly affections, my infirmities, my besetting sins. Receive me graciously. Put forth the mighty power of your grace in my soul. Subdue all. Rule all. Subjugate all to yourself. Will it not be for your glory, the glory of your great name, if this strong corruption were subdued by your grace? If this powerful sin were nailed to your cross, If this temper so sensitive, this heart so impure, these affections so truant, this mind so dark, these desires so earthly, these pursuits so carnal, and these aims so selfish, if they were all renewed by your spirit and sanctified by your grace, and if they all reflected your image, yes, Lord, it would be for your glory, both now and into eternity. 
If you have a, a shallow view of your sin and you need to work harder at digging up the roots of it in your own heart, know that to do so is worship that brings glory to Christ. And if you need to get away from the morbid introspection that has you locked on your own self, rather than looking to Christ and looking to the needs of others, to fight that battle is to worship Christ and bring him glory with eternal rewards. And really all the great heroes of the Christian life, the ones who are making great and glorious sacrifices for Christ, the ones that get things done for the kingdom, what are their lives really about? This same worship at the heart level. This is just the normal Christian life. So be encouraged in it. Look to Christ in it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being who you are, patient with the weak. You took on flesh to be amongst us, to be a faithful high priest who could feel along with us, sympathize with our weaknesses. And you never sinned, but you faced temptations, you faced physical frailties. You faced loneliness. You faced harm. And we trust you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to look to you in our fight with sin and not look to ourselves too much. And we ask this in your name. Amen.